Jill, just to be respectful of everybody's time, if you want to get started, I think we're good. All right. Thank you all for standing by and welcome to our webinar entitled Health Impacts of Algal Toxins in the Context of Chronic Illnesses. This is a brand new webinar series called Fresh Water Science that will highlight Ohio Sea Grant and partnering scientists every month. Every quarter is a different focus from human health and fish farming to harmful algal blooms and human decision making bringing applied research to the public on issues that affect our Lake Erie communities. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory, and joining me today are David Kennedy and Stephen Haller, both associate professors in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toledo. Dr. Kennedy's lab focuses on how the heart, kidney, and liver regulate inflammation and other cell damage, especially over the course of chronic illnesses. His team is particularly interested in finding preventative and therapeutic approaches to these diseases, including strategies to address the cellular damage caused by harmful algal bloom toxins. Dr. Kennedy joined the faculty at UT in 2015 after working in a number of research positions with the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Haller's lab is particularly focused on kidney disease, how inflammation and fibrosis play into the progression of end-stage renal disease, and what therapeutic approaches could halt or delay this progression. Like Dr. Kennedy, he is also interested in these questions in the context of harmful algal bloom toxins, especially in patients with pre-existing health conditions. Dr. Haller joined the faculty at UT in 2015 after a postgraduate fellowship with the American Heart Association. We're delighted to have both of them here today to, to discuss their work on how harmful algal bloom toxins can impact people with chronic illnesses. But before we get started, a few things about the webinars. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, around 1220, I'll conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to pull up the chat feature anytime during their talk, and I will collect and pose your questions out to Dr. Kennedy and Dr. Haller at the end of their presentation. As a reminder, this webinar has auto captioning and is being recorded to be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey at the, in the chat feature toward the end of the half an hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us to continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Kennedy and Dr. Stephen Holler from the University of Toledo, who will present health impacts of algal toxins in the context of chronic illnesses. All right, can you hear me okay? You All sound right. perfect. Very good, I'm gonna try sharing my screen here. And are we seeing everything okay? Looks great. Great, very good. Well, thank you everybody for taking time to, to join us in your lunch hour. I, uh, Dr. Haller and I wanna give a special shout out um, to the uh, seventh graders at North Olmsted middle school and uh, we just thanks for coming. Uh, I, I have a seventh grader myself at home uh, who's who's uh, probably I don't know if they would want to see this talk or not but <laughs> I invited them but they weren't as nice as you to come. So thanks for for coming and joining us uh, for, for this talk. So um, let's get started. So uh, the goals for today we're going to talk about what harmful algal blooms are. If you're attending this talk you probably know something about them so uh, we'll, but we'll just go over briefly what those are. Then we're going to talk about the kind of toxins that are produced by harmful algal blooms, including microcystins, uh, and then the, the target organs that they affect. After that, we'll review some of the current public health data on, on the uh, HAD toxin exposure. So what do we know um, from, from the uh, epidemiology and the, the studies that are, are done to, to see what, you know, how these affect uh, humans? And then in the, the second half of the talk, we'll talk about some of the experimental and preclinical data of, uh, of exposure and models of, uh, some of susceptibility in pre-existing disease states. Easy for me to see. So what are the, what are the kinds of um, comorbidities or, or other conditions, other diseases that might make you more at risk for the, the uh, exposure to, to these toxins? And we'll touch a little bit on preventative diagnostic and therapeutic strategies uh, going forward. So, and, you know, I, I want to start by saying, obviously, you know, this is um, a topic a lot of people are interested in. Um, and I want to be really clear 
uh, that you know some of some of what we know uh, is derived from uh, these uh, epidemiology studies, where you, you look out and you see what's what's going on. But those kinds of studies never tell you about uh, causation. Does something cause, uh, you know, does X cause Y? Um, so we can only look at associations. And we, you know, Dr. Haller will talk about some of the experimental models that we use to try to determine more as, you know, does, does X cause Y? Um, but again, those are just model systems. Um, so uh, we always have to sort of refine our hypotheses um, and, and see if we're on the right track. And, and so we'll, 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 again, just want you to view this talk in that, through that lens, um, so that you know that, you know, obviously a lot of this is, um, uh, is, is research, right? It's, it's in progress. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we'll try to keep those distinctions clear so that we don't, um, you know, go over the, the evidence that we have. So what are harmful algal blooms? Um, well, harmful algal blooms, um, or, or HABs that we'll refer to them, uh, are algae or cyanobacteria or blue-green algae um, that grow out of control in certain environmental conditions, including eutrophication. So eutrophication is essentially just excess uh, nutrients that are, that are going into the, uh, in, into the water. And actually you're looking at um, this beautiful uh, picture here uh, is from right outside our Lake Erie Center in Toledo. This was taken in, in 2019. So this is one of the harmful algal blooms that we had. So, so cyanobacterial habs or cyanohabs can produce toxins and these toxins can harm people, they can harm animals and just about everything that comes into contact with them, in, including property values. Um, and they can uh, affect, you know, recreation, swimming, and commercial and recreational fishing. So they're, they're a pretty big deal. They can cause human illness, which can be uh, debilitating or even fatal. And uh, they're a national concern because they not only affect, uh, you know, the health of people um, and marine ecosystems, but also the health of local and, and regional economies. So a lot of uh, you may know, um, you know, the, the, one of the things that really brought this to, to our attention was the crisis in, in Toledo where the water was shut off for a couple of days because uh, the, the limits of a, well, a certain toxin called microcystin exceeded um, what was, uh, you know, established to be a, a safe level. Um, so the, the, you know, entire city of Toledo and, and the surrounding area was impacted. Um, and, and this really brought uh, a lot of, I think, attention to this, especially in, in Ohio. Um, but these uh, blooms don't just occur in, in Toledo or in, in Ohio. They occur uh, all over the United States. They frankly occur all over the world. Um, and they're increasing um, in number and, and severity. And this is a picture uh, given to us by our friend, uh, David Ruck. Um, who's a, a videographer. This is actually taken over the border up in Monroe, Michigan. Um, this was in one of the uh, 2019 blooms. And you can see that, you know, this kind of brings home the point to us that we have some work to do, right? Um, there's, you know, people, uh, you know, out there right in, in the blooms. And the, the interesting thing about this, if you can see on the screen, um, I'm highlighted here in green, some of the signs that are, that are posted there that say, hey, don't swim, you know, don't, don't you know, come in contact with the water. Um, so anyhow, I think this, this is sort of a poignant picture, which brings home the fact that we, we need to, you know, do a good job about educating the public um, about some of the risks that are associated with these blooms. So what are the common toxins that are produced by harmful algal blooms? Um, this is going to be a very brief overview, just one slide, but um, on the, the left-hand side, what you're going to see are some of the common names of the, of the toxins that are produced. So you can see something called saxitoxin, anatoxin, microcystin, uh, which we'll talk a lot about, anatoxin, cylindrospermopsin. Um, and then on the, the right-hand side, you can see some of the, the toxins that you may be more familiar with or have heard about that sort of have a, um, an, an, an equivalent. Um, so you can, and, and this slide really uh, just drives home the point that these, these are pretty uh, serious toxins. They have, um, uh, you know, comparable, uh, you know, you can compare them with, with other toxins that are more well known and you can see, okay, um, they have some pretty significant effects. So this, this number here is called the LD50 and essentially it's just a measure of how, uh, how dangerous or how lethal um, a, 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 a toxin is. 
Um, so this again, just you know, it's, these are some of the toxins that are produced, and and um, you know they're they're uh, pretty potent. The target organs that they um, focus on, uh, you know, it depends sort of on on the the toxin. So this uh, is a, a, a slide that we made. This is a if you're interested, uh, I put a reference down here of a recent review that we published, so you can look into this uh, a little more um, by Dr. Apoorva Ladd in our group, um, which was just just published. But essentially. Um, you know, uh, harmful algal bloom toxins, when they're inhaled, they can uh, cause inflammation um, and weaken the walls of the, the lungs. Um, in the liver, uh, they can increase accumulation of fat in liver cells, and they can lead to death of, of liver cells. Um, in the gut, they can again lead to inflammation and cell death. Uh, and have been associated with some sort of uh, you know, some some kinds of uh, cancers like colorectal cancers. In the um, brain and nervous systems, uh, we know that some of these HAB toxins can cross the blood-brain barrier, and and uh, they can target different nerve synapses and channels, and can uh, damage neurons by inducing oxidative stress and inflammation. In the heart, uh, they've been shown to to cause uh, cardiac inflammation and fibrosis, as well as cardiac hypertrophy. So it's you know the the uh, the uh, sort of ballooning up of, of, uh, of the cells that form the heart. Um, and in the, the kidney have been shown to, to induce uh, oxidative stress and, and inflammation and cell death and potentially leading to a de decrease in renal function. So again, this, this data, uh, just to be clear, comes from um, some epidemiology, right? Some you know, observing of, of what goes on in humans like the colorectal cancers, but that's just association. Um, and, and then a lot of this data comes from experimental uh, model systems. Uh, so, you know, experiments in um, fish or, or uh, rodents, um, where we learn about the effects of these, these toxins. And this is a, a slide, at, at, which is a table that summarizes, again, some of those toxins that we talked about, microcystins here at the top, nodul nodularin, saxotoxins, anatoxins. And it, it shows some of the short-term effects, um, which uh, you know, depends on, on what the, the toxin is. So uh, microcystins affect the gastrointestinal and liver, um, but they also affect uh, you know, other, other organs as well. And so they can have short-term effects um, and they can also have long-term effects that uh, may progress, uh, for instance, in the case of microcystins uh, to some types of, of uh, tumor promotion and cancer. Um, so, it, and, and I guess the other important thing about this slide and, and, and looking at these different toxins is that, um, you know, microcystin, for instance, it's, it's in parentheses here, it says hepatotoxin. That means um, it's, it's, it targets the liver or hepatocytes, but that doesn't mean that it's the only thing that it does. Um, and as a matter of fact, these microcystins uh, affect a, a wide number of organs, and we'll talk some about those, Dr. Haller will. Um, because the processes, the cellular processes that they affect uh, aren't just specific to the liver. They, they occur everywhere, which is why um, there's, there's uh, effects beyond uh, the liver. And again, we'll talk about that later on. So common routes of exposure. So you can um, inhale these. We'll talk about, again, Dr. Heller will talk a little bit about inhalation risk, um, or I'm, I'm sorry, ingestion, um, consumption of contaminated food and and uh, water or supplements. There's actually a, um, uh, algal supplements that, that people take that uh, have been contaminated with these toxins. Um, and if my, there we go. Inhalation um, is another route of exposure. Again, Dr. Haller will talk some about that. And then dermal contact, again, uh, through recreational activities like swimming. So what can we learn from some of the public health data on harmful algal bloom exposures? Well, a lot of what we know um, is summarized here um, from the, the CDC. Um, and uh, this is a, this she, we, we put the uh, link here so you can see this is what the CDC tells physicians. Um, they even have a code for it. I'm not sure if my pointer is showing, but down here right below the picture, um, uh, there's, a, there's actually a code that physicians can use to code for exposure to these things so they can be tracked through uh, public health. But this is one of the, I'm gonna highlight this area down here. Um, and this is on tests and treatments. And this is really important because right now this is you know, sort of the state of the art. Medical care is supportive. There's no known antidotes uh, to, to these toxins. 
And there's currently no clinically available diagnostic tests for, for these. So this is something that we really wanna change because essentially um, if you go to the, the you know, doctor um, for this, there's not a test that they can give you to determine if you've had it. There's only tests that they can do to tell you that you haven't had it, or it might be something else. So it's called a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, and we'll present some data here that, that where we're trying to change that and trying to give healthcare providers the information that they need to actually diagnose uh, these, these uh, illnesses. And here is data that, that is, again, this is from the, the CDC's, uh, it's called the One Health Harmful Algal Bloom System. So this um, was a uh, 18 states participated in this. Um, and over this period from 2016 to 2018, they, they uh, you know, captured the, the data from exposures. Uh, there was 389 um, cases that were reported in that over that uh, two year period. And as you'd expect, the majority of those exposures occurred in, in public and outdoor areas and, and beaches. And over here, what you can see is, again, as you'd expect, the, the, um, you know, these illnesses occurred when blooms occur uh, and thereafter. So in late summer, July and, and August and, and uh, into the, the early fall, uh, again, as you'd expect. Where do people go uh, when, when they've been exposed? Well, the, you know, from this data from the CDC, the majority called uh, poison control centers. Um, some sought healthcare providers here in, in red and, and the emergency department. Um, so, uh, so this is where, where people normally are going and turning to for, um, you know, for, for help when they you know, think they've had an exposure event. And here are the, the, the symptoms that they reported. So mostly the symptoms are about a third of them are gastrointestinal. Um, uh, another 20, uh, 21% are, are sort of generalizable headache, fever, fever lethargy, um, dermatologic, that means like skin rashes, ear, nose, and throat, and some, some other um, uh, you know, symptoms that are, that are thrown in there. So we wanted to, to take, a, take a look at this. And one of the most, um, uh, the re re most readily available uh, data sets that we have are actually from emergency departments. Um, we, can, we can chronolog those and catalog those and, and look into this. So that's what, that's what we did. And I'll present some new data here. And this is um, from uh, what's called the, um, uh, the, the HCUP or the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project um, and Nationwide Emergency uh, uh, Department Sample. So, um, so this this is a uh, this is a, um, a a big database that comes from the Department of Health and Human Services, and essentially what we do is take a national snapshot of what's going on and diagnosis um, in in hospitals. In this case, particularly, we looked at emergency room uh, visits. And we gathered all the uh, data that was associated with harmful algal bloom um, exposures, their symptoms, lab tests, and, and outcomes. Uh, and then we put these into a big uh, uh, database and uh, scan through this data, um, and then uh, make some maps and predictions from this. And this was done by a really uh, talented master's student in our, our lab, Catherine Heldminiak. And this is what we found from, from this data, which was um, really sort of uh, interesting. So we, we went over the same three-year period or two, you know, uh, from 2016 to 2018 that the, the CDC uh, you know, took their snapshot. And what we found was that um, of people who, so was, there was 118 patients who uh, were admitted to the ER um, for harmful algal bloom exposures. 30% um, of them, about a third of them, had respiratory-related um, diseases as a, as a primary um, uh, uh, code that was associated with their, um, their, their admission to the emergency room. And over half of them had uh, some form of respiratory disease. So we think that's important. And again, Dr. Haller will talk a little bit about that um, on. Uh, uh, again, about a third of them were smokers and about 10% of them had, had diabetes. Um, and again, Dr. Haller is going to talk about some of the, the data where we think that these things are important. Again, this is bird watching, right? We don't know causation. We don't know if, if HABs cause respiratory disease or if respiratory disease makes um, uh, you know, HAB exposure worse. That's what we need to find out in the, in the lab setting and experimentally. 
So at this point, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Dr. Haller, and we'll he'll, uh, he'll go over some of this data. All right. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Sounds good. Perfect. Thank you, Dave. So what is the current experimental and preclinical data for microsystem toxicity, especially in models of susceptibility? And what are potential preventative, diagnostic, and therapeutic strategies for microsystem exposure? So here I'm gonna summarize some of our work uh, looking at the gut, the liver, and the lungs. And for these studies, we used a microsystem LR as a prototypical cyanotoxin. So have toxin exposure, what are some of the current knowledge gaps? Prevention, we do not know the health effects of microcystin exposure in common pre-existing disease states. A lot of the work has been done in healthy model systems. Diagnosis, we do not have adequate diagnostic tests to determine exposure to microcystin or organ injury resulting from exposure. And treatment, we do not have uh, therapeutic targets for microcystin induced organ injury. So the current World Health Organization guidelines for microcystin exposure are based on studies done primarily in healthy animals. But what about individuals with common pre-existing liver conditions like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, given that the liver is a primary target for microcystins? So here in this study, we used an animal model of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and in this model, the subjects were exposed to 50 micrograms per kilogram and 100 micrograms per kilogram of microcystin LR by oral gavage. And this was every 48 hours for four weeks. And it's important to note that these doses are well below the uh, established low uh, observable adverse effects limits in, in healthy model systems. So in this model of uh, pre-existing liver disease, you can see here by the yellow, um, indications here, and, and this is in the liver tissue, you can see accumulation of fat droplets or lipid in the liver. And in the red arrows, you can see uh, accumulating inflammation and that's both in the 50 and 100 dose. And on the bottom set of stains is just a more pronounced look at the uh, fat accumulation in these livers when you compare it to a control. So what you're seeing there is just increased damage in our pre-existing liver disease model. And next, when you look at uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, when you look at the excretion of microcystin, uh, the pre-existing liver disease mice demonstrates a significant decrease, greater than 60 times uh, urinary excretion of microcystin LR versus healthy mice. And you can see in the red bar there, that's the pre-existing liver disease model. And in the healthy model system, you can see a significant uh, greater excretion of microcystin. And this could be an indicator that microcystin is hanging around in the body and able to cause uh, additional damage, additional inflammation in this pre existing liver disease model. So, here in the non alcoholic fatty liver disease model, we demonstrate higher levels of MCLR toxin, that's on the left, and lower levels of the detoxified MCLR metabolite. Uh, MCLR cysteine compared to the healthy model system. So again, on the right, and we're looking at liver, actual liver levels, you see significant increases in MCLR in both the 50 and 100 microgram dose compared to healthy. And then on the right here, looking at the um, microcystin cysteine metabolite, the non-toxic form, you see significantly less in the pre-existing liver disease model compared to the wild type, uh, the healthy model system. And we've recently published this. This was in toxins. We recently published this in August of 2019. And we've also published new sensitive diagnostic methods developed for the detection of microcystins in urine, plasma, and serum. And this is in close collaboration with Dr. Drag and Isalovich at the University of Toledo in the Department of Chemistry. Additionally, we published new sensitive diagnostic methods that we developed for the detection of microcystins and microcystin metabolites in the liver. And again, this work was done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Isalovich's group. We've also published the development of new diagnostic insights for microcystin exposure. And this work was particularly interesting because what we were able to show is that common markers of liver injury actually do not respond to microcystin exposure. 
So here we're currently working on identifying specific markers that actually do respond to microcystin. And we have uh, two patents for our work in these areas. So the first is the method for detecting exposure to cyanotoxins. And the second is an improved protocol for pre-concentration and quantification of microsystems using LCM mass or mass spectrometry. So let's take a step back and just think about the liver model, right? So when you have a healthy liver cell, a healthy hepatocyte, and it gets exposed to microcystin LR, these healthy liver cells are able to break microcystin down to the non-toxic variant, microcystin cysteine, and the cell survives. Now, when you have a pre-existing liver disease model, such as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, when these liver cells get exposed to microcystin, they are unable to break it down into the non-toxic variant, and you get cell death and injury in the liver. Now, in some of our latest studies, when you take this pre-existing liver disease model, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you expose them to microcystin, and then you follow that up with treatment with antioxidants, such as PNAK-tide and N-acetylcysteine, NAC, we've actually shown that this help, helps boost uh, breaking down MCLR into the non-toxic variant, microcystin, and then you get um, uh, microcystin cysteine, sorry, and then you get cell survival or an improvement. Um, and we're actually working on this as a potential therapeutic in the lab. So now I'm gonna switch gears and we're gonna talk about the gut. So what are the health effects on the gut associated with exposure to HAP toxins? So a little background on inflammatory bowel disease. This is a collection of disorders characterized by acute and chronic inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract. And inflammatory bowel disease is a global health burden with an estimated 1 million individuals in the US and 2.5 million in Europe affected. The effects of MCLR and the progression of inflammatory bowel disease are unknown. So we asked the question, does exposure to MCLR actually exacerbate the severity of pre-existing inflammatory bowel disease? So what we were able to show is that MCLR actually does exacerbate experimentally induced inflammatory bowel disease. And the data I'm showing you here is gene expression from pro-inflammatory markers in the intestinal tissue from our inflammatory bowel disease model. So you can see here in the first graph, we're looking at TNF-alpha expression, a prominent pro-inflammatory molecule. And you can see that in IBD alone, TNF-alpha goes up significantly. But with microcystin alone, you do not see much of effect. And it is actually the inflammatory bowel disease model plus treatment with microcystin where you see this elevated TNF-alpha response in intestinal tissue. And a similar story for IL-1-beta, another prominent pro-inflammatory molecule in the progression of IBD. You see a significant increase with IBD alone, microcystin alone, not much of an effect, but it's this combination in the pre-existing IBD model where you see these inflammatory markers go up. And lastly, we have CD40 expression here, another prominent pro-inflammatory molecule. And you can see here again, similar story in the IBD the pre-existing disease model, you see significant upregulation of CD40 in the intestinal tissue. And here we also noted prolonged weight loss, uh, prolonged blood detectable in the stool, as well as exacerbated colonic shortening. So all, all signs of, of propagating inflammatory bowel disease in the presence of microcystin LR. So we've recently published this in toxins. This was published in June of 2019. And as a follow-up with the CD40 work, we've actually, uh, we recently published this in biomedicines where we, will we were able to develop a therapeutic peptide that actually blocks CD40 signal and this decreased microcystin exacerbation of inflammatory bowel disease. So now switching gears to aerosol. So how are HAB toxins aerosolized? And what are the human health effects associated with exposure to aerosolized toxins? So aerosols are produced by wave breaking, bubble bursting and recreational activity. These aerosols can be carried up to 30 kilometers from the source. And inhalation of aerosols may occur at the source or at a distance. So exposure to aerosolized toxins may lead to airway inflammation. So how do harmful algal blooms affect vulnerable patient populations such as those with asthma? 
So aerosol containing MCLR generated by the bubble bursting, wave breaking, recreational and occupational activity can be inhaled with unknown consequences. And the idea here is that this aerosol can lead to inflammation of the airways and actually worsen asthma symptoms. So modeling effects of harmful algal bloom aerosols in human lung epithelium. For these studies, we took a 3D air liquid interface, a culture of primary lung epithelium pulled from healthy volunteers, 14 healthy volunteers. And you can see down here, there in, in the middle, when you take a closer look at, at this uh, cell culture experiment, you have cilia and mucosa, mucosa uh, lining the top, a mixed cell population in the middle, and that is the well insert in the bottom. So microcystin LR aerosols were generated by a nebulizer and distributed evenly to the culture well inserts, and that's shown over here down at the bottom left. Exposure was once daily for three days at just three minutes per day, and we had three doses of microcystin LR, a low 100 picomolar dose, a medium 10 nanomolar dose, and a high one micromolar dose. So what we were able to show is just from that short-term microcystin exposure, we get uh, significantly upregulated key inflammatory genes in healthy human lungs. And you can see over there on the left, we saw a greater than twofold change in genes associated with mixed airway inflammation. And this was specific to mixed airway inflammation, but not general inflammation or another common lung disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or tissue scarring and fibrosis or carcinogenicity. So this was specific to airway inflammation. So in summary, harmful algal blooms are on the rise and have significant public health implications. Habtoxins such as microcystins can have both acute and chronic effects in multiple organ systems across the body. Public health data suggests the need for increased education and awareness, especially in vulnerable patient populations. Recent experimental data suggests that common pre-existing diseases in the liver, the gut, and the lung may increase susceptibility to have toxins. And research is needed to increase the preventative diagnostic and therapeutic strategies for have toxin exposure. So here, I just wanna to touch on this briefly. Uh, we have a, a collaboration with the Great Lakes Habs Collaborative Program to create a series of fact sheets on chronic low-dose health effects health effects via aerosols, health effects via the food web, and health effects on livestock. And here is an example of eventually of, of what these fact sheets will look like. We're currently in the final stages of, resigen, of revisions, but hopefully we will be able to get these uh, out to you soon. And with that, thank you. And I just wanna uh, point out some of the very important players in this work. So we've got Andrew Kleinhens there, who's our lab manager and has been integral in all these studies. Uh, we love Andrew, he keeps the lab running smooth. Apoor Vlad, our postdoctoral fellow who did a lot of the liver work with cyanotoxins. And then that's Robin Sue in the middle, uh, an MD PhD candidate that, that did a lot of the work with the toxins in, in pre-existing um, inflammatory bowel disease. And we have uh, Josh Breidenbach who has an NIH pre-doctoral fellowship to look at uh, have toxin aerosols and particularly in pre-existing asthma. And this last picture here is a picture from the Central Society for Clinical and Translational Research meeting in Chicago, where a number of our students presented this work and that is Catherine Hominiak in the middle who did a lot of the healthcare database work uh, the data present, uh, that David presented earlier. So with that, we really appreciate your time uh, and we're happy to take questions. All right, well, we have gotten some great questions during the presentation. So let me get started and ask Dr. Holler and Dr. Kennedy as many as we can and what questions they can't answer today, we'll post later on on the website with their answers. Um, we've got a, a good 10 minutes, so I think we can knock out quite a few of these questions. Um, the first question that we got, and I think a lot of us wonder this, so this is a great one to start. Um, our dogs love to swim in Lake Erie, like the Western Basin. Do these toxins impact animals the same way they impact humans? Great, great question. Uh, Steve, I don't know if you want to, how, how we want to do this. You want to do every other one or? <laughs> sure, go right ahead. 
right. It's so, um, yeah, so absolutely. We, we're really concerned about, um, you know, the, the, uh, our, our four-legged friends have a lot of the same, um, you know, uh, systems that, that we do, their organ systems. And so they, they definitely are susceptible uh, uh, to these toxins and, and the message is when in doubt, stay out. So uh, yeah, so we shouldn't, you know, have our, uh, have, have you, you don't want to expose your pets uh, to anything that you uh, wouldn't, you know, want to be exposed to yourself. So, so if the, uh, if there's an advisory or if there's, uh, you know, uh, any questionable water, the, the thing would, you know, the, the recommendation would be stay out because the toxins definitely can affect um, dogs and, and cats. Great, thanks. Um, I've also, I've got a great question from Mrs. Inslee's class from uh, North Olmsted Middle School. Um, and this goes, connects very well with the dogs. Um, can you talk a little bit about what makes HABs so toxic and deadly? Sure. Sure. So that, so, so not all harmful algal blooms are toxic. It's the ones that are, are are triggered and trigger the breakdown and release of the actual cyanotoxins, such as microcystin. Uh, that's what actually causes them to be toxic and which can lead to the potential um, adverse health effects and all the ones we just discovered. And particularly in our work, it's the, uh, the pre-existing disease states, people with pre-existing liver disease or lung disease or kidney disease that could be particularly susceptible to these. And that is an excellent question. Yeah, yeah. And that, that toxin microcystin that we study, again, it doesn't, the, the, the thing that it does, the, the, you know, not to get too deep into the biology, but the, the, uh, the process that it affects um, is, is something, as a process that's carried out in every single cell in, in your body. Um, so the fact that it stops that process uh, from, from happening um, means that it's just a very potent um, uh, toxin because that that process it's sort of like a light switch turning things on and off. Uh, and so if you if you hold it on, if you hold the light switch on in the on position, and the 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 processes that you need to, to for a cell to function can't turn off, um, then that it just uh, essentially causes mayhem in the in in the cells. So that's one of the reasons that they're so toxic. Great, thank you. Um, another question that we had was, and I think this was uh, Dr. Holler, one of your slides that showed um, the liver at different doses of microcystin, um, 50 versus 100. Um, are those like those doses, are those like similar to you going into the lake for swim and, and swim in Habs or that you're near Habs? Like what it, would that be equivalent or is it? Sure. I asked David, I don't know if you want to. Oh, to yeah, sure. so the. Yeah, so the the doses that we use. So um, in the in the what when the World Health Organization EPA when they they determine what's a you know safe uh, dose they they uh, perform studies in usually in some uh, uh, animal model like a like in mice or rats, and then they they see at what level you start to have uh, effects. And, um, and they, they determine what's called a, a no observable or a low observable effect limit. And so the important things about the studies that, that uh, we did is that we, we said, okay, listen, a normal, you know, healthy um, animal should not uh, have, have effects at these levels. But what happens if you have a, a pre-existing disease condition like, uh, like liver disease? Um, or non what's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So in that uh, situation, what we saw is that the levels that, that didn't cause effects in um, the healthy animals um, did cause effects uh, if you had, if you were genetically predispose, uh, predis predisposed to uh, uh, liver disease. So um, now, it, it's a tricky question to, to determine. It, it, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship. So you can't say like 50 micrograms per kilogram or 100 equals something you know, that's, that's out in the lake. But what you can say is that the, the levels when the World Health Organization or EPA determines those levels uh, and, and says that here's a safe 
here's a safe dose. Um, that's based on the those no observable and low observable effect limits. So um, there's some math that goes on when you when you know obviously the the we we're not doing these studies in 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 humans and in, in living humans. Uh, we'll, we do this, these studies in some sort of a model organism um, like mice and rats. Um, and so there are some conversion factors, et cetera, that, that uh, you need to take account for, for the way that uh, you know, a mouse processes the toxin versus uh, how a human would be expected to process the toxin. Um, but uh, the, the, the bottom line is that the, the research that we've done suggests that we may want to take a look at the levels um, that were that normal healthy people might be able to tolerate, um, and we even saw this in our in the animal uh, studies that a, a normal healthy functioning liver can process and handle a certain level that low level of toxin. But when you have a have a disease uh, like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you you uh, become more susceptible uh, to that. So I I hope that that answers the question. I the, the, the direct answer is there's not a one to one. Uh, relationship, you can't uh, say it, but we try to use the levels that are um, that are realistic um, and that would be seen out in in uh, uh, out in the lake uh, as the uh, you know as as our starting point. And the, the same levels that the World Health Organization uses, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Um... Could you talk a little bit about uh, potentially the latest research on airborne toxins that impact human health? Yeah, sure. So that's uh, that's a really important and exciting area. So if you recall the data that I've showed, so basically what we've been able to show is even just short-term uh, exposures can actually induce inflammation in the lungs. And in particularly that study we showed, those were in human uh, primary lung cells. When we have some ongoing data now in some of our animal model systems, uh, and particularly we're interested in pre-existing asthma as it's a, a very uh, common uh, form of lung disease and it's particularly prevalent right around this area, around the Great Lakes. So basically uh, what we've shown is that Certainly, these aerosols can induce an inflammatory response, particularly in terms of microcystin uh, LR. But then the next step will be to, to dig into the, the pre existing disease states, particularly asthma. All right, thank you. Um, what about um, dermal uptake of the toxins? Sure. Um, so yeah, for, for dermal uptake, uh, that's that's an important question, right? Because there's you know a lot of the exposure would be recreational people who are you know coming into contact and swimming. So the the bottom line for for dermal exposure is it, it follows the same sort of trend. A normal healthy uh, skin layer should be able to handle and exclude these toxins. It's not something that would just diffuse uh, through a normal healthy skin barrier. Um, on a, on its own, the the well, particularly the, the microcystin toxin is, is what I'm referring to. So it's 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 typically larger than um, the size, about twice the size of a molecule that would normally be able to just uh, passively diffuse across a skin barrier. But um, there are so there's two things. There are um, these toxins are taken up by uh, transporters too. So there's there's actually a, a kind of transporter that is on cells. Um, they're called OATPs or organic anion transporting polypeptides. If, uh, um, and and those uh, those transporters do exist on the skin. So technically, they you know they could be um, used, but there's really not a lot known about that. So we actually have a study that's ongoing to look at that. Um, and uh, and so hopefully that'll be uh, that's a work in progress, and we'll we'll shed some light on that. Um, but the other aspect of that is that the, not everyone's you know, skin is normal and healthy and intact. Um, so if you have a loss of integrity of your skin, that that might cause a, an issue. So um, there are certain common pre-existing diseases like atopic dermatitis that may um, increase uh, susceptibility. That's a hypothesis. We don't know that. Um, so that's what, again, that's one of the things that we're studying and, and looking at our models of, of unhealthy skin to see if the, uh, if toxins like microcystin are able to, uh, cross those, um, barriers again, because they, they typically have a loss of, uh, of, 
of integrity um, that would keep out normal toxins. All right, thank you. I have one more question for you. Um, and then the other questions, we have quite a few more and we'll, um, we'll get those to Dr. Kennedy and Dr. Holler and, and get them to answer those and put those onto the website. So you will be able to get your questions answered. Um, the last question is, um, can you use saliva or nasal mucus to test for HABs in humans? A good question. So yeah, that's a really excellent question. So the methods that we have developed now are for uh, blood, so in plasma and in urine and in tissue, but we have not developed a method for that yet. But that that actually would be an excellent source. I don't know if David, if you want to add sure. anything. Yeah. Yeah, so you 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 know technically could uh, do that, and and one of the things that people have found is that um, uh, the bacteria, the the cyanobacteria that produce some of these toxins, has been isolated from um, you know from swabs and and actually from lung tissue. Um, so the the not only the the toxin but the the bacteria that produces the toxin can uh, um, colonize uh, lungs. So it is an open question about where where those come from. So you know, do, do those come from aerosolization of, of contaminated uh, water sources? Um, are there other sources uh, that we don't know about? Um, so, but but we definitely know that they um, they can be isolated and, and detected in in you know the uh, mucosal surfaces like in the in the upper um, uh, nasal uh, airways. Um, and, and, uh, and, and the, you know, the actual bacteria can, can be measured. Uh, so again, it's, it's a, it's an area of, of research where, you know, we, we want to determine if, if that's, um, a useful way of detecting if, if you've been exposed and, and, um, if that leads to, leads to disease, the epidemiology or the public health data on that suggests that it may be associated um, with, uh, you know, certain forms of, of cancer. However, again, we don't know, um, you know, it's sort of the chicken and the egg right now because those are just uh, observational studies. So you don't know if the, the toxin is causing um, the, uh, you know, a, a disease like cancer or does, you know, is it the cancer that makes, you know, uh, a lung or an, an airway uh, surface more susceptible to colonization with, with these sorts of bacteria? So I hope that answers the question. And um, I, I guess, I guess as, just as we wrap up, just want to thank uh, everyone for their their time. And um, you know, we're we're always happy to answer questions. You, we want to thank the organizers from Sea Grant. Um, and if you want to get in touch with us, obviously we're, we have uh, um, you know through the Sea Grant uh, office. Ohio Sea Grant is a great way, or you can you know email us directly, et cetera. But uh, we're always interested in talking about this and, and just appreciate everybody's time and, and, and interest. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you both for uh, your willingness to talk to us today about your harmful algal bloom research. It was really an excellent discussion. Uh, also, I wanted to thank Christina for her work in organizing this webinar. Um, I'd like to remind all the participants uh, to uh, take a look and uh, fill out that survey that the URL is in the, in the chat feature. So please feel free to take a few minutes to fill that out. Um, as Dr. Kennedy had mentioned, uh, this webinar series is sponsored by Ohio Sea Grant and will continue next month with Dr. Stu Lutzen from Ohio State University, who will be talking about his research on a genetic tool to help manage walleye populations. The registration link is in the chat. Um, again, thank you, Dr. Holler. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy, for your willingness to talk with us today and all the participants, including the budding scientists from North Olmsted for being on this webinar. Uh, we hope this was beneficial and we hope that you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thanks again, Dr. Kennedy, Dr. Holler. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.